All right, 6.31 p.m. Tuesday, April 20th, 2021, to bring the Board of Selectmen meeting to order. This meeting is being recorded. Um, <coughs> let's see, start with um, uh, one uh, short announcement <coughs> uh, on Friday. This is a follow-up on the 40B topic. On Friday, we received a letter from Strategic Land Ventures um, uh, introducing a package from them that they intend to <coughs> submit to Mass Housing to proceed, pursue a conventional 40B development at Shingle Hill. Um, that package um, will be submitted to Mass Housing by Strategic Land Ventures at some point relatively soon, if it has not already, not already been submitted. And uh, when Mass Housing um, notifies the town of the submittal, it will open a 30-day um, comment period. And we'll update people <coughs> more when that happens. <coughs> In the meantime, the uh, package uh, from Strategic Land Ventures, the information in it will be posted to the town's 40B website <coughs> for the public to have access to. All right. Um, <coughs> so start with um, uh, agenda item number zero for any member of the public who has a comment they wish to make on an item which is not on the agenda tonight. And uh, uh, Gary, this is where you would say something. Great. Thank you, Levi, um, Eli, sorry, Eli. Um, uh, for the record, Gary Russell, 9 Magnolia Avenue. Um, also important to note that for the record, although many of you know I'm a member of the planning board, I do not represent um, the planning board as a whole or opinions of other members. Uh, I'd like to raise an issue with the board of selectmen that I think is important. Uh, as you know, uh, town elections are less than a month away now. And um, there are four candidates for two positions on the planning board. And I'd like to ask the Board of Selectmen to take a leadership role in ensuring that we have an informed electorate for this election. Um, in, in the past, there's been um, a reliance on, you know, a, a candidate submitting a letter to the editor, to the critic, and then if there's any competition or issues that are um, raised, it seems to unfold on Facebook group, which uh, is not, a, not an ideal situation for discussion. I, I would like the Board of Selectmen to consider hosting a candidates forum in which all of the candidates um, can present their qualifications, experience, their platforms. Uh, they can have interaction with the public and I think this would really be, for this election in particular, um, from my standpoint, I think is really important given what we've all experienced with the planning aspects, uh, with the planning board and with uh, the Board of Selectmen leading the 40B process that land use and planning issues um, have such a huge impact on the town. It's extremely important. And I'd like to understand or make sure that uh, the public knows um, the choices they're making. So if we could have a candidates forum, that would be great. If uh, in addition, whether it's candidates this year or folks who are serving on boards and committees now, I think it would be a great policy to have that on the town website that um, all those folks that are decision makers have um, CVs or bios posted on the website so that when the public is listening to comments and um, discussion that you know everyone can understand um, where folks are coming from in terms of background, experience, education, et cetera. Um, so I can happily follow this up with a formal letter, but I, I wanted to get this in tonight because um, a month can slip away pretty quickly. So that's, that's my ask. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, I will comment that I think that there is possibly some, an independent um, <coughs> a candidates forum being considered, um, <coughs> but I don't know the details if that is uh, uh, going to happen uh, sooner than that. 
All right, um, let's move on to item number one on the agenda. It's actually this is a public hearing, but this is not a formal public hearing in the sense of uh, uh, state law. <clears throat> uh, this is just the town uh, uh, processing an entertainment license from the Manchester Bath and Tennis Club. Um, <clears throat> So uh, we have an entertainment uh, license uh, requesting to do um, uh, entertainment for a musical duo every Thursday um, uh, on July and August from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, board members, do you have any uh, questions or comments on this application? Eli, if I may. Go ahead, Becky. Um, I just want to disclose that I am a member. However, it would have no bearing on um, how I would respond to this. All right. <clears throat> Actually, before we go around the rest of the board, um, uh, Holly, did you have any comments about this application that you wanted to make? Um, well, I just wanted to let you know that um, we are very thoughtful of all the neighbors and that's why we have just a little duo, um, usually just guitars and singing and it's facing the beach so that it doesn't disrupt people. And um, it seemed to be very positive last summer. Um, and I apologize that um, we didn't know about the entertainment license. Um, I think it came around last summer and we um, were finalized before um, we came before the board. So um, I am open to any questions if anyone has anything to ask regarding it. All right, let's uh, go around the horn. Uh, Becky, you've already commented, made your initial comments. Uh, Jeff, any questions or comments? Uh, the B&T sells al alcoholic beverages. Yes. And, and my question is, how are you going to monitor people taking alcoholic beverages out onto the beach, which is not part of the b &T? Well, the beach is private, first of all. And secondly, they have to come up to the bar and give their member number to be able to get a drink. And we don't actually sell alcohol. We don't use money. So it goes on to an account. Jeff, if I may. Yes. It is a private beach. The Bath and Tennis owns that part of the beach, so it's private property. And there's no beach association of the neighbors? The neighbors have a separate beach association. There's a portion of the beach all the way down in Gloucester, which is public. And has the Beach Association been notified that this was going to happen and had a chance to comment on it? Yes, sir. All the abutters have been notified. Okay, those are my questions. Thank you. John Round. Yeah, Holly, um, you mentioned you, you had the same program last year and kind of the same, same, same sort of setup. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Anything different that when I say same sort, anything different uh, that you learned last year that you say, I don't think we got to do it this year or do it differently in some way, or is this pretty much an identical? Uh, um, it will be an identical program and it was very successful and it allowed our membership to be able to enjoy some entertainment in a safe um, COVID, um, you know, environment that we were experiencing last year, where they were able to sit spread out very far on the beach together in their own family bubble and, um, and just watch the sunset and listen to some music. It was very pleasant. Okay, good. I just wanted to know. So you've, you've had experience with this and we haven't heard any, I don't think any, any issues associated with last year. So good. Thank you. And Harrison? Um, I gather that you will be, that people will be able to take drinks out onto the beach or do you intend to stop that? No, they are allowed to do that. And what I'm, I'm, 
weighing is the advantages of um, not having broken glass on the beach versus using plastic. We don't have glass on the beach at all, anywhere. Actually, we only use cans. Ah, cans are good. Thank you, that's it. Thank you. <clears throat> Any further comments or questions from members of the board? I still have a concern, Eli, that um, about how the consumption of alcohol beverages on the beach is monitored by the B&T during this. Um, and in particular, the access of uh, minors to alcoholic beverages. That can be well controlled within the setting of dining at the B&T, but um, I'm concerned about it in terms of this extension into the beach. Elon, may I speak to that? Sure, go ahead, Becky. As a member of the BNT for almost 20 years, well, give or take, um, this has always been the case, given that it's private property and people are allowed to take beverages, alcoholic beverages, down to the beach. People are very responsible. Um, no, nobody's serving alcohol to minors because that would jeopardize the BNT's license. Um, additionally, the BNT staff do monitor um, consumption and don't just randomly keep giving alcohol to people. I have, and again, in all my years being there, I have never seen an issue where this has come up. Greg, are there any constraints um, uh, as a matter of state law regarding this aspect? No, not in terms of state law. It, the, the alcohol license is is, a, is to define the area where it's to be served. And I, I don't have that in front of me right now. Um, so I don't recall if on the license, an area of the beach was included. Um, and, and typically we, on a light alcoholic license, um, you know, that the area of being where it can be served is, is defined and, and delineated. Um, so there's a, I think an issue here on the on the beach potentially of it of it not being quite as clearly delineated as it would be either on a patio or or you know obviously indoors. Um, so perhaps there's a way for the club to delineate um, the beach area where you know beyond which beverages are not to be taken. Jeff, would you be comfortable if um, uh, the uh, application were um, <coughs> approved subject to the Bath and Tennis Club conforming to the, um, the lineage of the, their alcohol license? Well, Holly, I wonder if you can clarify what the alcohol license says in terms of this. I'm sorry to say that I don't have it with me at this moment. Okay. Um, is there a reason why we need to approve it tonight as opposed to at our next meeting so that we can get clarification of this? Because it seems to me in, in the guidelines that we dealt with for outdoor dining, um, which were emergency guidelines, and I understand that, um, there was a lot of attention paid to um, the manager of the restaurant and or an assigned staff member or a delegated staff member um, monitoring the use of alcoholic beverages outdoors. Um, and I'm, I'm just, uh -huh. I'm seeing the same parallel here. And, you know, Becky, you said that you're a member and this is not gonna affect your decision, but I hear you advocating based on your experience, but advocating for this um, very strongly. So I, I'm, I'm concerned about the delineation in the license 
and the monitoring. Those are my two concerns. Eli, may I respond to Jeff? Yeah. Um, very quickly, Jeff, if, if I seem to be strongly um, supporting this, um, it, if there were issues with this, I would come at that, that I felt were negative, I would have no problem saying that. But a lot of what I'm hearing are issues, for example, um, the managers and the staff are constantly floating around, moving around, keeping an eye on things. That's part of their job. And they do closely monitor what's going on for anything inappropriate or untoward. There are, um, there are sandwich boards that, that define the B&T's beach part and do say that, you know, don't, don't go out of here. You're not, you're not supposed to be carrying beverages around. Um, and that's the only reason I'm just trying to clarify my perspective and what I've seen firsthand and understand firsthand because I figure, you know, information to make a, an informed decision is always good. Again, if there was anything unacceptable about this and the beach is contiguous with the property, so it's one, one property, it is monitored visually and physically with people wandering around. Um, that's all. So it, it's, it's following these sort of guidelines and they're, but again, I would definitely recuse myself or vote in the negative if I felt it merited that. Also, if I may just comment, um, again, I just want to reiterate that, um, members have to come up to the bar and be identified as a member and a person legally able to receive an alcoholic beverage before they are given one. And then they are also um, submitting their membership number, which get, goes into the computer. And so it all has to compute for them to be able to receive a drink. And it, they're not just being, they're not just in a cooler for anyone to grab or anything like that. It is strongly monitored. I understand all that. Um, there are also minors that are in the area um, who come with their families. Um, and, you know, I'm hearing that the situation is monitored. I'm also hearing that there's some ambiguity in terms of what the specifics of the um, alcohol beverage license say about the beach and whether that's included as part of the license. Um, those are the concerns that I have. Those are the concerns I'm raising. I would like to see this delayed until we can get that license issue clarified. Um, but the board will do what the board's going to do. All right. So <clears throat> this license, again, is for July and August. Uh, there is some uh, time leeway here. Um, do board members have any objection to postponing the approval vote of this license um, to our next meeting? And we can gather a few of the additional materials to discuss. Mm -hmm. Holly, I'd like to understand whether lining up for the entertainment that you are gonna be using will be impacted by delaying until um, May 3rd, which is our next meeting. It will not be delayed. I mean, it will not be impacted now. Thank you. Okay, then I would like to I would like to uh, suggest that we move this into the next meeting, and have a clarification on what's in the license. Any objection from board members? Other board members? Nope. All right. We will continue this on our May third meeting. Thank you, Holly, for the application, and we'll get in touch with uh, additional materials that we want to make sure we get at the meeting. Thank you, Holly, for understanding my concerns. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Okay. Good night. All right. Agenda item number two, COVID update. Uh, <clears throat> and outdoor dining. So um, in the COVID update, we um, continue to see relatively low numbers. 
we are continuing to work in low numbers in town. We are continuing to work with um, uh, Bruce Tarr's office regarding the potential for a regional, a Cape Ann regional vaccination clinic. Uh, we await for information from the uh, state still on that. I think we're going to hear more about that maybe tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> Doug, do you have any other things to add on the COVID update side? Uh, no, Eli. Those were the those were the highlights right there. All right. We have uh, two uh, uh, restaurants on, on, under this topic. We have two more restaurants applying for uh, temporary outdoor dining. Those are the applications from the Mooring and Antique Table. Um, uh, there was some discussion about the possibility of um, uh, the rear parking area behind Cal is being used. Doesn't sound like um, uh, that we can get agreement between the uh, various different parties on that. So we're sticking with the um, uh, parking spaces. Uh, uh, public safety officers have determined that the parking spaces need to be um, surrounded by Jersey barriers. And that's what we're doing. Um, <clears throat> and then the other thing besides the two restaurant applications that we have tonight is uh, police and DPW are recommending that a temporary warning or flashing sign be placed near the intersection of Pine Street. Uh, so we'll be uh, discussing and voting on that tonight. Let's do the um, applications first. <clears throat> um, so uh, antique tables application, we'll do that one first. Um, uh, board members, have you had uh, ample opportunity to review this? Do you have any questions or comments from the antique table managers? I have a few questions or points of clarification, Eli. Sure, go ahead, Becky. Um, one was um, just on there, um, on the license, it, it states their hours as being um, weekdays, nine to midnight and Sunday, uh, 12 noon to midnight. And I just wanted um, them to know that they needed to include Saturday hours on there. Or at least it was omitted unless they don't wanna serve alcohol on Saturdays, but I kind of think they probably do. We definitely do. Okay, I thought so. Um, and then um, there, the um, how many uh, on the application? It looked as if you all were looking for um, it. The application said twenty four seats, whereas when I look at the seating and at least the out front seating, it only shows seating for fourteen. Will you all be using the um, the back deck? Yes, that is correct. We have okay, the. Uh, Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Yeah, we have the front. We were we are petitioning to use the front, but we also have our back deck still open. Okay, so how many? I guess how many are there? Ten seats back there. Is that where the twenty-four comes from? Uh, I don't believe the twenty-four would have included the back deck. No, the twenty-four would have been a potential for having maybe a, a, a different table in between. If you're looking at the diagram, it shows three tables in the front in the Jersey barrier. And perhaps right. they were thinking that there's a, at round table number eight can seat five people. So they yep. were saying potentially, but typically it, we just try not to use all of that space. We typically try to fill it from the back all the way out to the front. Okay, great. Thank you very much for clarifying. I appreciate You're welcome. it. And just to clarify <clears throat> for the record for um, Gail uh, Hunter, who's taking minutes tonight, um, who's speaking on behalf of Anti Table tonight? This is Maria Shanley and Andrew. Oscar Guerrero. Guerrero. Thank you. <clears throat> all right, other board members with questions? Yeah, yeah. you'll. Yes, uh, go, ahead, ahead, go ahead, Ann. Oh. Um, go ahead. Yeah. I thought we had said that we were prepared to offer one space 
which I think is closer to 18 than to 30 feet. The diagram distinctly mm -hmm. shows 30 feet. So last year we were only given one parking space where Calis had three, the Moor the Mooring had two. You guys were all over the place and how the Jersey barriers were set up. We requested as the summer went on to have additional, but were not given it. So we thought that perhaps this year you were giving more than one space. So we were requesting two. It doesn't mean that you guys are are doing that. It just was a Hey, by the way, last year we only got one and everybody else got two-ish more. So we just thought maybe you guys were trying to figure out. We thought out maybe we weren't paying attention. No, I know you were paying attention. We thought it was unfair. So we were pretty upset last year, but we understood that we have the back deck. It's just everybody in town. It's a small town. So everybody commented, like, what did we do wrong? And I don't think we did anything wrong. It's just is a matter of. We're on a corner, we understand that, but to make it all uniform would be the best for us as well. So if you're giving one parking space, we will alter our diagram. And that's not a problem. We just work. It's a wishful thinking. Is there actually three feet, if you have your tables eight and 10 out there with, with five people or however many, is there, does that leave space for three for ADA access to the sidewalk? Yes, absolutely. In fact, we have a, a person that always comes in his scooter wheelchair and sits outside. And there is plenty of room because what we did last year was we pushed it up to the space where the parking the parking was where the Jersey barriers were. Yeah, I, I'm just trying to look at table eight and imagine five chairs on it, an 11 foot wide sidewalk, and and it looks tight. So what happens if we do seat uh, five guests on table eight, we will block table seven. We will reduce the amount of guests uh, being seated on that table. It's but all- That's not ADA. Pardon? What I said is that table seven is on the other side of the curb and you will be pushing people off the sidewalk over a curb to make table eight work. Table eight would be pushed up against the curb and, and it, it, it does work. It just, because there's a huge space between the front of our building and that area. And for whatever reason, depending on how the Jersey barriers are, that table works, but it's not, we do block off table seven and we can just slide table eight out and relocate seven in, if need be. Because table seven, six and 11 are high tops. They can be relocated easily. And, and eight is a sliding round table. It's not, they're, they're heavy tables, but they're easily moved to accommodate for everybody. But typically what we do with five people is put them in the back where we have allocated a dedicated six top on the back deck. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Jeff? What's the diameter of table eight? Five by five? Yeah, I think it's five. I'm not 100% sure. I, I would have to get back to you on that. I think it's a five by five. We can measure it and let you know. It, it looks round. It's very round. <laughs> so when you say five by five, I'm not sure what you mean. It's five feet in diameter? If you went and drew drew this, it would be five feet this way and five feet that way. From, from one spot of the table to the other is five feet and one, one side to the other is five feet. Not a square, but from one, from the middle out is a five foot. Thing. So it's five foot radius. Thank you. Five foot diameter. diameter. From the middle out is five feet. 
from <laughs> side to side is five feet. So if you were, if you cut, if you spliced it in half, it would be five feet. Okay. If you laid a body right across it, it's five feet because it's literally four inches shorter than my height. Okay. Um, I'm, uh, I'm also uh, experiencing the same concerns that Ms. Harrison was raising. Um, Understood. But um, this is right up against the curb. Yep. And people who are sitting on the side that's closest to the curb, what prevents them from falling over the curb? They're, they We don't put chairs on the side closest to the curb. So if you look at the diagram, we, we literally never have done that. So we put one on the side closest to the next building, one on the side closest to the inside before you get to the curb, and one that literally is closest to our building. It's three people sitting typically there. A lot of times there's just two people there. Oh, okay. Well, if 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 that's the case, that's different than when you said originally you said five for the two. No, no, we we've always it, it accommodates five people easily, but we we don't even put the chairs out for five people. We've had requests to reserve it. So we reserve the the ability to make it a five top, but making it a five top requires us to relocate table seven. It's just a, literally, it's a swing space for us. Okay. Because we don't have a lot, I mean, obviously during COVID things change, but in addition, we, we don't have a large number of tables that accommodate a huge amount of people. And we only have one large round table and that's it. And did you request last year for two spaces? Yes. At the beginning of the season? Yep. Like everybody else, but we found out during the middle that it wasn't even a question of that. Some people had manually moved their Jersey barriers without you guys or the town actually doing it. And they, they joked about it to us, but we would never have done that. I would never approve that. I wouldn't even suggest it. That's absolutely not the way to handle things. So we just, we just thought that we would bring it up and tell you, Hey, listen, we did everything right last year. If you are giving two spaces, that would be great. If you're only giving one, well, we, we can figure our stuff. It's totally fine. It was on our wish list. Okay. John Ron? Yeah, Eli. So I, I, I want to kind of get settled on exactly what our policy is. From our meeting the last time, I think that we were all at one space. Okay. And there was a flex space at Cal is after five. But I heard you say, I think earlier today, that um, the police chief would prefer that um, barriers encompass the whole street street area. Was that correct? Correct. So the flex space was pending uh, whether or not public safety officers thought it would be reasonable to um, support that with those temporary barriers on the okay. uh, downstream down traffic. Right. Uh, of, um, uh, parking on street uh, um, dining and the public uh, both chiefs uh, did not support that temporary um, uh, space with uh, a less robust um, uh, barriers they they think it's important uh, they were unanimous in this um, that there be jersey barriers protecting all aspects of the um, uh, street dining so the flex space at Cal is, is not currently going to happen. They have one space. Although I, I think barriers are out there essentially for two spaces right now oh. at Cal is. Mm -hmm. yes. Certainly one and a half. Yeah, it's bigger than the one at the, <laughs> it's, the it's, it's bigger than one. OK, and so I, it wasn't clear to me. I've, I've seen that out there, and I, I guess it's there pending a decision. But it sounds like that's not the case. So. It's going to be kind of a one and a half, and then we've got to treat people <clears throat> in a fairly equitable manner here. I know that we're we're thinking about two spaces for an antique tables simply because things are quieter there. They're certainly not quiet at Calas, and Jeff, I would say I that. John, 
I think yeah. you mean Black Arrow, not Antique. Excuse me, Black Arrow. I'm sorry. And I don't think things are necessarily quiet at Antique Table. This kind of a there are a number of um, number of shops in and around that area. Uh -huh. So um, I think we need to kind of know whether we're going to go with the one or the two space approach here, and we don't have that yet. Is that correct? That decision has not been made. That decision was made. Decision was made. Well, it, it was one with the flex for two, but the, the, the decision on whether it's flex or not flex has not been made. Certainly there are no made. flex spaces. According to, to um, Chief Fitzgerald and Chief Cleary, they would, they would not. All right, well, that, that. Was, that was a decision that was made after the last meeting. Right. Okay, so, so that wasn't, that's not a matter of record until now. Okay, so there are- there, The black there, arrow is getting and a half or two spaces because yeah. they're not as busy with the walking shop that's right next door. But we who live in our own block and have nothing next to us, we are not gonna get two spaces. Excuse me, so the- uh, out, out of curiosity. So I'll, sure. I'll answer that, but I want to not get into. No, no, I'm just asking because last year was a problem for us, and and okay. we were humiliated by it. Okay, okay. So uh, at the board meeting where Black Black Arrow did not ask for any spaces whatsoever last year, they were asking for spaces this year. Um, <clears throat> Black Arrow has very very limited space on the inside of their restaurant, and. Uh, there was a discussion at the board meeting that says not, you know, we don't need to take a one size fits all approach depending on the circumstances. So if a restaurant has um, very little inside capacity, we might consider two spaces. And that in fact was the very specific decision in the case of Black Arrow. At the, perfect. Uh, that's, what, that's perfect for us to know because that way I can say to people, that's, that's the reasoning behind it. So feel free to give us one space and we can we can figure out our diagram based on that, but we're, we definitely are okay with that. Poor Black Arrow has really limited seating. We do understand that and we do not. John, do you have any more comments or questions? Um, I, I'm just wondering what your, um, what, what the other folks on your, on your block have said, the other, the other vendors. I mean, I'm okay with two, if they're okay with two. We have, we don't share anything on our immediate sides we have something a little further down that's a flex space and then beyond that there are a couple of shops but but around the corner there's a wine store and a couple of apartments but we haven't yep. heard anybody say anything because when you take away those parking spaces in front of us we still have to have employees park around the Jersey barriers just for safety of our guests, because of course there's that yeah. corner. So we want to be careful. And then that leaves all the parking further down in front of those shops, but we can ask them if you'd like, we'd be, be very I'll happy just, to go and make yeah. sure that we are not offending them. And keep in mind that we're really open only, only in the evenings at this point. But the barriers are there all day long. The bad, that's the, that was the challenge. Yeah, the, yes, yeah, yes. They're, they're tied up all along. I, so, well, I know that you do have a benefit of parking on both sides along, along the common. There are quite a yes. few slots, and that's not something that further downtown, and that's, that's a disadvantage. Just not as many spaces on both sides of the and street. People don't generally walk from here to downtown. They think it's like a no. mile away. I have no idea why that perspective has happened no. to us. Okay. So, well, I'm, 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 I'm okay with the two spaces at this point. I would like to know what your, uh, well, who's in the Robardi building? Uh, Jay McLaughlin and they're right next to you. Actually a little further down, right next to us. It, that... they're, they're further down. We have a little bit of a break because our building stands alone. Okay. There's just that break between the next one. That one has a swing space. Sometimes it's art, sometimes it's other right. things. And then the Jay McLaughlin. And then further down is the swoop, I want to say, and the uh, hair salon. Yeah, 19, okay, right? that's that's further down. That's yeah. further down. So, uh, I, I'm okay with regard to table eight. I, I also have the concern. I don't think anybody. If you look at table eight as a clock, nobody should be sitting at six o'clock. Okay, I, I don't know if you can put in tables at 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 ten o'clock and at two o'clock, and at four o'clock and at eight o'clock. 
if you're following my reasoning here. Yes. That's fair. Yep. Um, because that would not necessarily block people walking by, but that would be the max. Um, and ideally, you'd really want people at nine and three just make it a two person deal. But um, um, the other that, thing that we could do is depending on when the Jersey barriers go up, because obviously there's a thickness involved, we could see if maybe one of the round tables would fit out within the Jersey barriers and relocate one of the other four tops inside. That's not, that's not out of the question. It's just not having had the opportunity last year to do that. It, it, it would be very different if we had two spaces. And then we would just send you a diagram of what our configuration looks like if that works out measurement wise. But like I said, it just matters on, at least for us, measuring it out. So it's absolutely a six foot space. Okay. I'm good, I, Eli. Uh, Jeff. <clears throat> Did you say that your employees park at both ends of these barriers? We asked them to park, especially on in, by the 11. Not so much by the seven. We're less concerned that the seven is going to back up in, but where the 11 is, it's it it can be scary for guests. So we just ask that one of our employees puts their car there if, if the space is available or when the space is available to make sure that that person is protected. We had a blinking light out front last year. Just honestly, it's just to be cautious for our guests. Are you saying there was no Jersey barrier on that side? There is a Jersey barrier, but because of the corner, we just wanted to be very careful for our guests not to feel afraid. So we always told them that to the extent that we can, we keep an employee car there so that there's further protection for them. We have a lot of a lot of people in town who are older that come here and they enjoy sitting outside, but they also are scared. For a lot of them, this is a whole new world being able to sit out on, on the street in Manchester. And not that we're the busiest town, but they were apprehensive. So we, we did what we could. It also, from the perspective of COVID last year, it also made sense not to have people coming that close to a Jersey barrier for them. That way they knew that nobody would ever get within even remotely near them because somebody's car was always there. Okay, I, I understand your logic. It's just that we've put restrictions on where employees park. No, no, at, I realize that. At other that. restaurants, at other restaurants um, to free up uh, circulating spaces for um, retail businesses. I'm assuming that this year you guys will take a look at where you put the Jersey barriers and maybe perhaps you will accommodate that space so that there is no parking when you put the Jersey barriers down uh, surrounding it from that side so that somebody wouldn't be tempted to drive in to the Jersey barriers by mistake. But we do also have our parking for employees right in the back of the building. So this is something that could be easily fixed. Um, and employees from town park behind yes, the police so station we, with we, their residence. Behind the police station, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But we have designated yeah. parking there for our employees. Yeah. That was just, we were in the okay. I think that that consideration needs to be taken. That needs to be taken into consideration um, to perhaps take the space that you were concerned about. That would be great. And that would actually be directly in front of our, our space so that it would be in line of sight from the employees to see outside if there was an issue, which probably is for all of us the, the best during a pandemic to be able to see what's going on outside. It's, also, be, re it's also a requirement of the license. That would be fabulous. So if somebody, <laughs> if somebody drops the jersey, not, not that, not right that your employees side. don't park there, but that it's all within line of sight and can be visualized from inside. That of would the be absolutely great. If the jersey barriers could go in in that particular space, that would be awesome. Because last year it wasn't; it was actually off center. 
Um, I wonder if either Chief Cleary or I know Chief Fitzgerald is on the line, whether they have any comments about putting the space, putting the barriers in that space. No, I don't have any uh, issues with it. I just have, I'd like to take a look and see uh, where exactly they would uh, want that Jersey barrier place before I, you know, made an official ruling on it. Sure. Yeah, that would be the same for me. I don't have the diagram in front of me, so I'm not sure exactly what spot we're talking about. It's the first spot as you pull onto the street, taking a right. That first spot was open last year, and the Jersey barrier was in the next spot up. It would be helpful if you took the first two spots as you take the corner so that they're directly in front of our building directly in front of the, all the windows of our building, not necessarily directly in front of the front door. Yeah, closest to the crosswalk? Closest, or? No, closest to when you take the turn onto, going, heading towards the black arrow. You'll see, you'll see when you just walk in front, it just was further up by our front door last year, which is not direct line of sight for anybody. It's a small hallway with one window that you'd have to be directly standing there to even see outside. You you can just see when you take a walk over, or if you're around. Jeff, do you have any attendance? I'm done. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, did you have any other uh, comments? <clears throat> no. Eli, um, yeah, go um, ahead. I don't see how we went from one space to two in front of the antique table. I, I, I understand that, that one member of the board didn't see that that was a problem, but it is a large restaurant. Um, they have already outdoor space. Um, I don't see how we can give them two spaces without having to give everybody else two spaces because everybody's going to say that it's unfair. May I respond? Um, actually, as the general manager, we are still operating within six feet inside. That means even though we are allowed full capacity, we are actually only able to seat about 80 people, including the outside door. So for a whole year, winter of me having no customers inside the business at all and now struggling now this is our chance to make a little money so we can stay in business so that's why we're requesting because right now we're still being restricted by six feet inside that means that we've reduced our capacity by about 40 percent uh before we were able to seat about 154 people now we can only seat 84 that's why we're requesting two spaces. It has nothing to do with any other business. We're just here for the community. People enjoy our food. Um, we, are, we are done early, so there's never anyone hanging outside too late. We're very responsible. Uh, so that's, I think that if you are able to provide us with two parking space, that would help us during the busiest uh, month, which are coming up between May and September. It'll be an opportunity for us to make a little money. That's the, that's the only uh, request we're making. Eli, if I may. Sure, and I want to um, start to put a time box on this because okay. we have a time on this, and we have another one to go. Okay, I just I just want to um, support second what Ann said in that um, antique table is the largest restaurant in town and. And I mean, we have, when we're looking at the other restaurants and parking spaces, and while I wish we could really just open up so much parking for everybody to try to help the restaurants recoup, I think I, I just can't see two spots for antique table, especially when they do have the back patio um, or the back deck and, a lot more seating inside than anybody else does. That's my feeling. And, and that's fine. I mean, we'll, we, we are okay with that. As long as we get one parking space and we're able to put extra uh, seating and 
we're we're fine with it. Uh, we thank you. We thank the board and the city very for much. what you're able to do for us. Thank you very much. And we do understand it's just for the safety of our 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 guests too. If you ever come into the antique table, it makes it makes it much easier for people to keep five five plus six feet away if we have outside dining. It's helpful for our, our guests as well as our employees. Yeah. Um, uh, I will, uh, I think, uh, join uh, Becky and Ann uh, since we did take that position before with respect to overall um, uh, allowing one spot for restaurants. That's the position, position that I think the board should maintain right now. Um, so, uh, uh, Eli, one more quick, it's the, um, I heard it said that some of the people who are already have Jersey barriers out may have exceeded what we consider to be a single space. And could I ask who in town would be responsible for measuring that and correcting it if it happened? Greg, you want to comment on that? Happy to do that. Thank you. All right. Uh, do board members um, want to see this redrawn with one spot, or should we just approve it with uh, one spot tonight? Eli? Ahead, do we need to modify the number of seating, the seats that they're requesting? Um, and if not, I'm comfortable going ahead. I think the easiest thing to do is if uh, Antique Table could just tell us if we restricted you to one spot, what table would you take out? Mm -hmm. uh, we would have to, so we will keep 11 table 11 and table seven, and we will remove the center table six, and we will also remove table 10. Uh, we will keep table eight. All right, there's your answer, Becky. Thank you. All right, and I will. To approve antique tables uh, application with tables six and 10 removed and restricted to one space. So moved. Get a second. No second. 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 All right. Any discussion? All in favor, roll call vote. Ms. Jakes. Yes. Mr. Bob McTurner. Yes, I would like to see it be the space that is closer to the front of the restaurant so it can be better visualized than it was last year. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Mr. Round. Yes. Ms. Harrison. Yes. Mr. Bowling votes yes. All right. Uh, let's move on to the uh, application from the mooring. Um, so, uh, board members have seen the packet from the mooring. Uh, comments or questions? Um. um, it does look like two parking spaces. Really? I think they said on the latest diagram that we got, uh, eight by 20. Okay, then I don't have, I'm looking at the wrong part of the packet. You know what? It just um, came in later. There was an email sent out, um, I'm afraid, at around 11.30, um, this, no, 9.43 this morning. Uh, mm -hmm. from an updated diagram. So it was a two by two table and a four by two table with a, I think, an eight foot separation. So they have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight diners in that space. Mm -hmm. And then two under the window. Under the window. Total of seats at total of 10 seats. It looks like they've got a 
roughly back to the next space. Will they be serving lunch since they open at 1130? Uh, hello, this is Mike from the morning. Sorry, I can uh, intervene a bit. Yeah, we are going to be serving lunch. Thank you, Mike. No problem. Yeah, and that is one space. That was the same diagram I submitted last year with two spaces. I made sure I took out the secondary space that was in front of the bookstore. So from what I understand, like 20 by 7.9 is one space. Um, and then from what I understand, the tables need to be far enough apart that the seats are six feet apart. And the health inspector told me that. So I use the eight feet instead of six feet between tables because I just don't want to tie myself up with the health code violation. And I, know, I don't know who enforces it, but we're very careful to do that. So we, we had said um, the board uh, six foot table, table edge to table edge separation. Those are the guidelines I think that we put out. So if you want to okay, then maybe there, then maybe there was a miscommunication. I could probably maybe fit something else in there. But when I talked to um, Bobby Cody, the health inspector, she had told me on numerous occasions that the seats have to be six feet apart. So I don't know if maybe me and her just kind of had a, a miscommunication there, but that's why I drew the diagram I did. When did she say that to you? Uh, it was sometime last summer. Oh, yeah. But I know they kept they they kept changing the uh, the regulation, so I don't know if I'm up to date on it. Maybe if it's just table space have to be six feet apart, then um, that's actually better for us. So, yeah, regulations uh, in, in this particular circumstance, yes, they change frequently. Yes, the current guidelines from the state and most what most of the other towns are dealing with is six foot ta uh, ta table edge to table edge right now. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, Questions from board members? Oh, uh, Chief Clear, you had a uh, comment you wanted to make? I, I did, and uh, maybe uh, Chief Fitzgerald could correct me. I know both of us last Thursday had a question in regards to not being able to determine um, exactly the locations of Jersey barriers and tables based on the diagram, and we're hoping to get a new diagram. Um, I'm going by the old one, that's the only one I have. So I was not able to make a determination, nor do I believe Chief Fitzgerald was either based on the previous diagram. So I have not seen an updated one to uh, weigh in on it. I don't know about uh, Chief Fitzgerald. I have not seen the uh, new diagram either. I just had the old one that uh, is kind of uh, hard to read. Yeah, and again, I apologize on that. I, I'd used a pencil instead, so I kind of tried to clear, clarify it a little bit. So I don't think it really, when I scanned it, came through. Um, as well as it should have. Well, then, if we approve this tonight, we would approve it pending um, uh, approval of the um, uh, public safety chiefs on the placement of Jersey, Jersey barriers. I have a uh, question, Eli. What's that? Go ahead, John. Okay. Uh, my, my, what's the width of the sidewalk here? Uh, the width of the sidewalk, I believe it's, it's around eight feet. Eight feet, and so you've got a, a a table for two. No one, no one facing outward on the sidewalk. Just a table for two. That is... no, they would be pushed up against the side of the building. That's the only way we could right. fit it. We actually ordered now more narrow tables where the bench is in front of our restaurant right now, um, to fit with a three foot walkway. Because last year we did the entire sidewalk and just trying to get more tables out and seeing what other restaurants had done. I was trying to use more okay. space on the sidewalk since it's only one space this year instead of two. And, and people are sitting at where the X's are. So there's no X that is uh, out toward the sidewalk, the, the walkway where the public would walk. Yeah, there wouldn't be a, a seat over there. Okay. Eli, if I may. Uh, I just forwarded the, um, the drawing to both, not that they can make a decision now, but both to Chief Fitzgerald and Chief Cleary. All right. Other uh, comments from board members? Are board members prepared to approve this application pending review of the Jersey barrier locations by the safe public safety chief? If so, could I get a motion to that effect? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Mr. Bodmer Turner? Yes. Mr. Round? Yes. Mr. Harrison? Yes. 
Ms. Jakes? Yes. Mr. Bowen votes yes. All right. So Eli, if I could just get some clarification for just a minute. Yeah. So I think one of the issues, as I as you think about, you know, one versus one and a half spaces, um, angling angling the perpendicular barrier barriers instead of being at a ninety degree, mm -hmm. that that can make the difference. <laughs> so if if we're angling them, then the then the the street facing, you know, the, the, the outside barrier is not going to be the same 20 feet as the sidewalk one. Okay. Unless, unless you start taking up more space and it angles beyond 20 feet at the sidewalk edge. Okay. So, so if you want to keep with the angled barriers, you're either going to reduce the space that you're giving people or you're going to take up more parking. I think if you, hmm. still worth looking to see if it shouldn't take a half a space, which is nine feet, to angle the barrier by a foot and a half. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're, I, I agree with that, but again, it's, <laughs> perception is everything in terms of how much space it's taking. So the simple question is, A, do you want to keep with the angle, and B, yes. is the space where the barrier meets the sidewalk, is that going to be wider, slightly wider by about two feet than what is being nominally approved? I think we need to keep up the angle. And look at that. Yes, I, um, Greg, I, I might suggest you need an angle probably on the up traffic side, but maybe not necessarily on the down traffic side because you have to back into that particular space. Mm -hmm. People getting out of the up traffic side need that angle to maximize their ability to move. But they don't need it on the down traffic side. Yeah, that's a good point. That'll help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well done, John. I got an A in geometry. <laughs> <laughs> With isosceles triangles? <laughs> and trapezoids. Ah, let's, yes, even better. Let's, let's get going. So we still have a couple of other items to cover under outdoor dining. Um, so one is um, the Black Arrow, the police and DPW recommended a temporary warning sign, a flashing sign to be placed near the intersection of Pine Street to slow people down as they're coming around the corner heading in towards Black Arrow because that's a, a, high, a higher speed entry in town. Um, Am I the only one hearing a lot of interference? I'm having a hard time hearing. Oh, sorry. That might be on my end. I'm, I'm actually at work right now. We're getting a little busy, so I'm trying to tie this oh, up. So okay. I back. All right. So uh, we need to give our approval for the uh, and warning light uh, near the intersection of Pine Street. Any questions or comments from board members? Did we finish that vote? For which vote? On the license. For mooring. On the parking space. Um, yes. Yes. We did. Yeah, we did. Okay. Thank you. Um, <coughs> the flash and sign authorization. Any questions or comments from the board members? Do we know what it's going to look like? We're going right. to. I would defer to Chief, uh, Chief Fitzgerald, perhaps. 
Yeah, it's going to look like a uh, regular street sign. Uh, I don't have the uh, dimensions in front of me, but it's, uh, it's, it's diamond shaped. And on the edges, it's going to have a flashing uh, like LED light when, on, uh, when it senses oncoming traffic. It's solar powered. Uh, basically, it's going to be mounted onto an existing pole in the area. And uh, so there'll be no, no new poles, but the truck is working on uh, what company to uh, purchase that from. But it's going to be sort of between Morse Court and Central Street. Uh, so alerting traffic coming into town. So will it be located near near Black Arrow? Just up the street from it. Okay, thank so, you. So I guess the concern was the sight lines of Central Street and uh, our previous speed study that we did last year, mm -hmm. I think around uh, September, which indicated the speed coming into town was higher than uh, posted. Uh, so with the sight lines, we thought it would be good to at, at least warn the traffic uh, that was coming into town that there may be something in the road or in the slowdown. And, and what does the sign say, Todd? Slow. And, and the sign will operate 24-7 whenever a car is coming through, regardless of the time of day or... Yeah, that's that's correct. It's a solar powered sign. Um, okay. Like I said, it's got LEDs uh, uh, surrounding the outside. I, I I can send it out to you guys to see so you can see it. But uh, uh, it's basically a temporary thing that will probably just be out there while there's uh, you know the outside dining's happening. It's good to hear that it's only triggered on traffic. In other words, at two o'clock mm -hmm. in the morning, it's not going to be doing much of anything. No. No. So okay. Questions from board members? Can I get a motion to approve the temporary sign near the intersection of Pine Street? Temporary how long? As long as we're doing outside outside dining. Okay. So so we'll, second. So, sorry, second. Ed, second. <laughs> second. <laughs> second. 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 All in favor, roll call vote, Mr. Bodmer Turner. Yes. Mr. Round. Yes. Mr. Harrison. Yes. Gates. Yes. Bowling votes, yes. Um, <clears throat> all right. Uh, we also had a request, which I forgot to mention before, uh, regarding painting uh, some additional temporary traffic uh, parking um, spot lines out in front of uh, Kellas and um, <clears throat> uh, Mari, et cetera, like we did last year um, to better delineate the parking spaces um, to prevent people from or encourage people not to take up uh, essentially two parking spaces next to the barriers. Is there support from board members for that? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. John. Yeah. All right, uh, Greg. Can we um, make that happen? Um, would it make sense to delineate all of the spaces downtown? Greg, comments. Uh, I, I personally think it does make sense to do that. Um, I think people people need the guidance. Uh, I understand that sometimes you know some smaller cars will fit into a bigger space, two smaller and a one and a half. But if you look around, most people are driving bigger and bigger cars. So <laughs> I think it's helpful. I think it's helpful to have the delineations. A question: What what is the standard size for space? I mean, we, we've been pushing around numbers 16, 18, 20. Eight by 16. Is 16 feet is a standard parking space, if there's such a thing as a standard space. Uh, I thought it was 19 in our- I don't know. I'll have to double check. I thought it was nine by 19, but I, I'll double check. It, it is in the regs. Yeah, I would think so. I would agree. I think it makes sense to um, delineate. 
question is, do we want to do that now or um, uh, after we have adjusted, uh, after outdoor part, uh, dining is gone? Yeah. I think we want to do it now because I agree with Greg. I used to think that you'd make, get more cars into an undelineated space, but I don't believe that anymore. I think it will make it easier, it make it po possible for more people to park downtown and, and make the retailers and the people who drive their cars to the restaurants happier. some board members Greg if we uh, did this do you want this in the form of a vote uh, yeah sure yes please so can I get a motion to uh, paint parking lines in the downtown area parking spaces to delineate the parking spaces according to um, the size of parking spaces uh, in our bylaws. So moved. Second. Any discussion? One, one question. So there's some barriers up in these spaces right now. They're going to be, have to be moved in order to do that? Well, maybe they'll paint those lines later. So long as they, well, somebody's got to measure, get out there and measure and figure out how this is going to be laid out. And I hope that doesn't make things a little impractical. I think we can, uh, but. I'll work, yeah, I'll work with DPW on that. Okay. I'll call the vote, Mr. Was there going to be more discussion? Nope. Mr. Bob Turner. Yes. Mr. Ram. Yes. Ms. Harrison. Yes. Jakes. Yes. To bowling votes, yes. <clears throat> Any other comments right now on uh, uh, COVID and outdoor dining before we move on? Yep. We, okay. su we suggested that it was suggested that having the barriers painted uh, would make the whole situation a little less ugly. Someone suggested have it, asking the school to do it. Um, I probably suggested that perhaps the restaurants might, might want to do it. Um, has anybody approached the school about painting barriers? And if so, uh, what was the reaction? Yeah, I'm sorry, I did approach the school. There might be some interest there. There was also uh, a suggestion from a resident for um, uh, somebody who um, has painted bar uh, barriers in other towns. Um, if uh, board members would be supportive of this, I would suggest that we turn over the option seeking to uh, Greg and Sonia and uh, give them the authorization to proceed however they see fit for signing a resource to do this. I'm not sure having the restaurants do it is the best choice here. Mm. If the restaurants do it, we could put in restrictions that, that they be abstract and suggestive rather yes. than eat at much work. But then we would have to do that. <laughs> Just don't have, let them do that, then we don't have to deal with that. Greg, if you, if you, when you pursue this, I'm, I'm not sure how the logistics are gonna work. It's not really the safest thing to be painting barriers in the middle of the street. Um, I don't know if you have barriers, extra barriers, and you can paint them there and then swap them out once they're painted. Uh, it's just... Or flip them around, paint them on the uh, inside and flip yeah, them around. You got, or, or yeah, are they symmetrical on both sides? Then that could be done. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll figure out. Yeah, figure that out, yeah. Yep. Yep. I'm, I'm comfortable with having Greg and Sonia lead this up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, there was one other issue that we had discussed the last time we met uh, regarding parking, and that was the uh, designation of 15 minute parking space uh, across the street from uh -huh. um, Cala's outside of uh, Richdale's um, on Beach Street. 
uh, the corner near the corner of Beach and, and Summer. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't know whether we need to deal with that tonight or whether it needs to become an agenda item since it wasn't specified. Um, we've kind of lumped a lot of things into um, outdoor dining here. So we had discussed it last time and um, I just wanted to raise that tonight. Okay. Given the, the lateness and the fact that we've run 45 minutes over on this agenda item, I would like to push it to the next meeting, if you're okay with that. I'm okay with that as long as it's a specific to agenda item next time and that the research that needs to be done on it needs, gets done beforehand. Yep, will do. <clears throat> All right. Um, <clears throat> moving on to item number three on the agenda. Policy to uh, fire department bylaw and policy request. Greg, do you want to uh, add this one? Uh, I'll start it off and I'll hand it over to Chief Cleary pretty quickly. Um, two different policy uh, requests. One is regarding um, additional elements for um, sprinkler systems for um, uh, congregate living facilities in particular. Um, so a more robust sprinkler and fire and smoke alarm systems. Um, and that uh, certain existing um, buildings would, would be given, I believe, uh, five years to come into compliance if it was something that voters approved. It does require a town meeting vote um, to adopt this section of state law, make it part of the local regulation. Um, the second request is for um, uh, a numbering system for buildings to indicate uh, the various uh, particular hazards that might be contained in that building and become part of a database that the fire department has and would be um, on, on the trucks. And so that as uh, firefighters are responding to an alarm at a particular address, uh, they can uh, go in knowing what to expect. Um, and there'd be a, a numbering system and the chief can elaborate a bit on, on both of those. Sure. Uh, the first one, um, under Chapter 148, the Fire Prevention Chapter on the Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 26, most of it has already been adopted by the state, and there are only two chapters that need to be adopted individually by towns in order to make them um, become effective, uh, 26H and 26I. Um, I included the language, 26H primarily deals with lodging or boarding houses, um, conjugate living, uh, rooming houses, fraternity houses that would require them to be sprinkler. Uh, this would be something that um, if a new change of use came in for somebody wanting to create a boarding house or a sober house or a lodging and rooming, then we, they would have to do the sprinklers up front. Um, but by adopting this, any existing ones that meet the criteria in uh, either of these two, uh, chapter H, would have five years um, to design, have it approved, install, and have a sprinkler system operational. And section I deals with multiple dwelling units and new construction. Um, so any new lodging houses, boarding houses, fraternity houses, dormitories, apartment, townhouses, condos or hotels, motels, group residences. So anything coming in new under this would then need to be fully sprinklered. And the benefit with the sprinkler system, for those that aren't aware, it's an automatic system. It is not there to put out the fire, but merely protect the residents and give them time to escape. And it's especially uh, helpful to us where we have low manpower. Um, sprinkler systems are automatic. They don't need to be manually activated, similar to a smoke detector. And they're part of the infrastructure. They help take any type of human element or human failure out of the question. And I'm open to any questions. This may not seem well you said the state had accepted um most of the sections and i didn't read carefully and i ran into section 26g yes 
Um, that is this, I, I realize it's, but does that mean that any residents of more than uh, 7,500 square feet, gross square feet, yes, should be any, sprinkled? Anything new coming in would, would have to meet that. There's no grant. There are a lot of houses that size in this town. Right. The, the G is not retroactive. The G would be for new is my understanding. Okay. And we are not discussing G in any, in any event. We're just- No, that's, our, talking... that's already in effect and can be enforced. Okay. So we're talking, fine. Just H and I. Yep. Eli, may I ask a question? If Ann, or, I'm sorry, Ann, are you done? I'm done. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Ben. I have two questions. Um, does this also pertain to um, Airbnb situations? Um, I didn't see that in this. It would depend on what the state defines an Airbnb as. Um, if it's not listed as an apartment or a motel and it's not coming in new, I would say if somebody was building something specifically to be an, an Airbnb and, and not an owner occupied at some point, then it might fall into one of the other definitions of a motel or a rooming house or something like that. But my understanding of the definition, um, it's, still, it's still in flux. Um, Airbnbs are still somewhat of a moving target with respect yeah. to those. Thank you. Um, my, my other question, and then I had a comment. Um, my other question is, who's responsible for maintaining um, and certifying the functionality of, of the sprinkler systems? So under the NFPA codes, um, anything that the NFPA requires, such as a sprinkler system or a fire alarm system, it's immediately attached to an NFPA maintenance code for those same systems. And it's incumbent upon the owner of the property. And there are very specific um, guidelines that have to be maintained with, depending upon the size of the sprinkler system, it might be a quarterly inspection. It might be a yearly inspection, very similar to fire alarm. So somebody would have to pay a, a certified company to come in, uh, inspect it, make any deficiencies, and then they would be forwarding the paperwork to the fire department. Thank you. And you then my, my last, my, just my comment regarding this evening is um, just in terms of town meeting, I think this is something that I would like to see brought forward to town meeting this in the spring. The other, I think um, perhaps we could hold off until the fall, unless the fall is getting too loaded up. Thank you very much, Chief. I appreciate your help. You're welcome. And I can explain more um, once we finish up with H and I on the other, the other proposal. Right. Jeff, um, I have a question. Is the uh, five-year uh, grandfathering, or not grandfathering, but five years to compliance for um, existing structures? Yes. Is that, is that part of the statute? I don't see it in the statute. Let me show you where it is. Um, it was in here because. So if you look at paragraph three, any lodging or boarding house subject to the provisions of this section shall be equipped with automatic sprinklers within five years after acceptance of this act by a city or town. Okay, I just missed that. No, no problem. Um, what's the enforcement on these? If there's non-compliance, what's- uh, Well, what's... Uh, I imagine in conjunction with the building code, they could lose a certificate of occupancy if it was deemed a hazardous uh, a hazardous building, then it could be forced to be evacuated. Um, it would violate the building code at that point, as well as the fire code. People could be cited, um, so it, it, they would need they would need to be compliant. Okay.
Those are my questions. John? Yeah. So, um, Chief, well, what's kind of the definition of a, a lodging house, not even a boarding house, a lodging house? I'm, I'm, my question, I guess, gets down to places like condos. And there are lots of condos that are one building, multiple units, but it's one house. Right. A lodging house is very specific. A lodging house is usually separate bedrooms. Um, most of the time, I believe the definition is three or more unrelated but it has mutual uh, like cooking and living areas. So where an apartment or a condo would be separate, each unit would have its own bedroom and its own cooking. Um, but if you had a condo and there were five different people living there, it might fall under a lodging and rooming house at that point. So it's, it's, it's so you don't have transient people um, being there, like a fraternity. A fraternity they, they, is they to a lodging that. and they, rooming house. Yeah. Although they Everybody's exclude got that a bedroom, but <laughs> yeah. it's group kitchen, group dining room. Okay, okay. so it's yeah, so it sounds like condos. Uh, I mean, those are separate living units, although structurally they're in the same structure. Yes. But that they would that they would not fall under Chapter H, but they would fall under Chapter I for speeding sprinklers if they were four units or more combined together. Oh, and there are lots of those in town. Yeah, I, I is not retroactive. But age right. Is. Okay. That's only for new new construction. Yes, new construction. Okay, but that doesn't go back. Okay, all right. So I, uh, you know, do you have any idea how many structures might be affected by this in town? I do not. I would I would have to go through the database. I know one right off the bat. I think you're going to find out. <laughs> yeah. But I would work in in conjunction with the building department, and uh, look and with the assessor department to find out. Okay. Okay, and I was curious about the Airbnb thing and that, that Becky had brought up because that, that came to mind pretty quickly. Okay. I mean, I, I know a lot of places are looking at it as if you're renting something, then it needs to meet the same standard as rental housing. That's where a lot of the codes and the uh, prevalent discussion is headed. Mm -hmm. So this would, this would apply, uh, Chief Cleary, to um, the powder house apartments? More than, yes, more than likely. If, if we're doing new construction or significant and we're increasing the number of units, um, that this would then come into effect. That's what they're increasing the number of units. Well, significant renovations would need to bring it up to code. And if in doing the renovations that it, it, it meets the criteria here, then it would have to be sprinkler. The same way that the other 40B project was coming in would be an apartment building that would need to be sprinkler. However, if, if those units wound up being sold in a condo type of arrangement, they would not. Um, potentially it would have to be what the building was, what the occupancy was rated as, as what, how it was classified. And it's usually, that's where you get into the specific definitions in order to classify a building or a residence. And a lot of times it has based on the use. It, it may be number of units. It may be, whether it says individual units, it may have to do with the height of the building, how many stories. So that would be taken on a case by case basis in that respect. Without seeing plans, I, I couldn't comment definitively on that, but that would be determined during the plans review. All right, so my thinking on this is that um, generally I'm supportive of the concept, but I am very much concerned that if we put this into the Springtown meeting, there are going to be a lot of questions. Um, I think uh, all the questions that we raised tonight would be raised by residents. They would be concerned about it ahead of time. If we wanted to put this into the Springtown meeting, we would certainly want to put out um, some pretty detailed communication covering all these topics in advance. Um, 
Otherwise, the discussion is going to be long and drawn out at town meeting. And it may be relatively long and drawn out anyway. Any other comments from board members? I, I think, Eli, I agree with you. I definitely agree with you. Um, but I also think that this can be consolidated in terms of the questions that we've been asking tonight um, can be consolidated into a set of bulleted highlights that would be less than a sheet, maybe a sheet for H&I. Yeah. I mean, H&I cover a sheet, a single sheet of paper. Um, but pulling out the details of H and I could be done in a bulleted form. I, I don't know that that would necessarily raise a longer discussion. Uh, not if it's sufficiently well communicated ahead of time. I tend to agree. All right, where do board members sit on these? Putting them both, uh, one or both of them on the uh, town meeting warrant for the spring. Well, I can explain a little bit more on the second one if we're done with the H and I, if that would be acceptable. Sure. So Annex E talks about adopting uh, a firefighter safety building marking system. And what it would be is a reflective Maltese cross. Um, it would primarily be on um, uh, commercial buildings and in each area of the Maltese cross, it has information that's germane to the firefighter coming up to the door. Talking about the type of construction, if it has a sprinkler system, if it has any special hazards in it, if hazardous materials are stored there, it just gives the firefighter up a, a heads up to know what they may be getting into. Uh, if, if it has a truss roof, if it has a truss floor, these are all firefighter safety concerns that if we've never been in the building and it's three o'clock in the morning and the building's on fire, the only way we're finding out is to get inside. And then we're, we're at the, the mercy of the building at that point. This would be done during annual inspections. This would be done after plans review and a building was being built. Um, it would be uniform and it would have all the information we need. And um, that's why the NFPA put it in place um, all the Maltese crosses would be uniform in size. Um, there's a rating system to follow based on the types of construction. And that, uh, you know, we would, uh, the fire department would be kind of in control of it. We would be, know whether it was a low hazard building, a high hazard building. A low hazard building might be a retail shop. A high hazard building might be a hazardous, uh, hazardous material storage warehouse. But that would be determined through inspection and then the buildings could be marked with this and we would know ahead of time. Similarly, with the second part of this about vacant buildings that is already in the code and can be enforced with the placarding. Um, as you may know, it doesn't take long once a building is vacant for uh, it to deteriorate and no longer be safe, especially under fire conditions. Um, the placards, like I say, are already in there. There's a, there are set marking, there are NFPA certified markings. Um, that doesn't necessarily need to be approved, but there's a few um, additional hazard markings that are on the bottom of the last page about being the roof being open, the stairs missing. These are if vandals had gotten in there or if renovations were underway on a vacant building and hadn't been completed yet. Again, this placard would go on the outside any place we would enter during an emergency. And based on the placarding would let us know whether there was no life hazard and we shouldn't go in because the building is likely to fall down or we may be able to go so far and assume certain amount of risk if there's a life safety issue. Um, the example I can tell you is if anybody's driven on 127 heading up towards Gloucester there's a series of three buildings on the left-hand side that sit on a hill that have been vacant for a long time. And if you pay attention to those buildings, they are all placarded with these types of placards. And again, it's a firefighter safety. If we pull up and we see a red square with an X, that means there is no interior firefighting. We're doing everything from the outside because it's too dangerous. And these would all be predetermined. There is 
um, language in the code that determines what makes it a vacant building. And that's in conjunction with the building inspector and the building codes. I don't foresee having to use these a lot here. Uh, based on what I've seen, property gets filled pretty quickly and not much stays vacant. But in the event that it did, I wanted to make people aware that this, we are able to do this in the code and I'm just looking for approval to add uh, a few of those letter designations to the actual code itself. Comments and questions from board members. Yeah, I have a question, Eli. Uh, Chief, so as I'm, I'm trying to understand, is your intention to put one of these placards in every building in town or just on those that exceed a threshold where there are concerns and and and, and firemen need to know what's going on? Because the, I, it seems to me the vast majority of the buildings are, you know, they're one family homes and nothing right. particularly special. Right, well, the, the, the primary focus would be on those uh, starting with those that prevent, present the highest hazard to us that, that we're aware of, either based on the type of construction, the age of the building, or what's being stored there. It would give us the ability if new buildings came in that had significant hazards for us to require them right up front. I, I don't necessarily see that we're going to go through and put one on every building in town. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's, I would... that's certainly that's not the intention. Right. But it, it, okay. it would be standardized. And again, we'd start with the high hazard buildings that would be the biggest threat to us if we didn't know what was going on within them. All right. Yeah. Well, I would think that's probably a fairly short list here, but I would not be in favor of going well after be. all of the buildings. <laughs> um, the yeah. interesting thing is a lot of the new construction, in, even especially in residences, that's where more of the firefighters are getting killed because of the engineer lumber fails a lot quicker and a lot faster in the hotter fires. And firefighters are getting into more trouble in single family residences and dying than they are in the large warehouses and, and buildings such as that. So it's just something to, to keep in mind. Eli, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, yeah. yeah. Um, briefly, uh, we've been talking about upgrading software for firefighters um, and police, um, and I'm, I'm not sure, but, you know, because this is an old system, it's been around for a while, I assume, because um, I remember seeing these things a long time ago. Um, There seems to me to be a question in my own mind, and, and maybe I'm just naive, that you got to get to the door and be able to read this thing in circumstances that may not necessarily make that easy to do. Um, and if there were some kind of digital database that could be accessed on the way, or that the dispatcher could access mm -hmm. and communicate the information to the firefighters who are on their way to the scene or who are at the scene. Um, would that be a better system than this passive system? I wouldn't necessarily say it's a better system. I, I would say it could work in conjunction. Some of the new software that we're getting it has a pre-planned element where we could, we could uh, uh, enter some of this information in a database. However, what that doesn't take into effect is if we have a lot of mutual aid coming. Um, if we're tied up and we have no coverage in town and one of the mutual aid companies is responding to our building, they will not have that same digital access to any of the information. So if we're not in quarters and Beverly is coming to a building downtown that they've never seen before and never been to before, they wouldn't have the digital information. So this is a placard for anybody going in that building to make you, you know, take a look and see, see what would be there. Okay, I, I understand that. Um, I also assume that Beverly would be notified by the dispatcher and the dispatcher could communicate that information to Beverly. Uh, but yeah, but, that would be but I understand it being something that you're suggesting would be done in conjunction. Sure, sure. So, and again, sometimes simpler is better. Um, 
in respect, if you walk up to a building and see a big, large uh, white X and a red square, that, that gets your attention. It may be old technology to do that, but it, it, it definitely is not something you have to worry about a computer glitch or somebody put in the wrong information or- you know, I'm, more like I'm more concerned about not being able to access that square yeah. because, of the, because of the incident. Yeah, well, the code mentions that like, say for the vacant building, it, it is placed by every entrance that you could possibly be going into that building. So if you would approach a building from any side and had four sides and four doors, there would be a placard on every one of those doors. Just precisely for that, if you didn't have access or you couldn't see a side of the building, you wouldn't be going in blind and miss the, the X on the opposite side of the building. So there are provisions for that within the code itself to, to prevent that from happening. Okay. So for the Maltese cross, can you clarify again, um, ultimately, uh, would it be your expectation that after adopting this law, ultimately all buildings in town would be required to support these? And under uh, when would they be required to do that? Yeah, I, I wouldn't, based on the current staffing and what it would take um, w without a full-time fire prevention person that's Monday through Friday or even two people, um, to, to garner this information from records and to actually go about it, I, I wouldn't set a deadline. I, I wouldn't say it's my initial expectation that every building in town would have one. Uh, again, it's primarily there if we inst it's institute it to hit the highest hazard ones and then work back from that. But even identifying those is going to take a while. Um, similar to putting the data into a database it's great when you have it, but the, the front end work and the amount of research and data entry that you have to do can be very time consuming. And, and we're not st staffed at a point that that would be very prolific. Okay. So I wouldn't want to put like any type of proposed date by X that everything would be done because I, I really couldn't promise that. But so it's I just another tool to help us keep us safe in the interim as as we're able to get to these different buildings. Yeah. Um, so I want to, um, so looking at this from the standpoint of a resident, resident might wonder, like, all right, so two years from now, five years from now, is the fire, but fire department going to knock on my door and say, hey, you need to put this on your door right here mm -hmm. or on your window right here? Mm -hmm. Is that what this? I imagine it could go. That's that's not the vision I have right now. I mean, I, I guess if it was adopted, that that would be a possibility. Um, but if we didn't feel that it could pose a hazard, you wouldn't have to worry about putting these, one of these on. It, it's again a firefighter safety measure, yeah. and everything would be on on a gradient in that respect. Um, I, I I do know, you know, even in looking in in, in the current codes, we have that. Um, that the address is supposed to be visible, that, that there is something that the letters in, on, on the house, or the numbers on the house have to be a certain size, have to be a certain contrast. And, and as I drive around, I, I see a, a huge number of homes that, that don't meet that. And I assume in order to enforce that, you would have to have somebody driving around knocking on doors all the time. And I assume it hasn't been done because nobody has the staffing to be able to do that. So yep. that, that's a similar thing that would help us, but you know, that's not anything that's immediately achievable. It, it requires personnel and, and time. Okay. Questions from other board members? I, the, the whole concept of, well, it could be everybody, but it doesn't, we're not, we don't know when. I, uh -huh. It's just too amorphous for my pleasure. Well, I could say it, then the intent, you know, would be to have it on every building, but that could take 20 years. I, I, I wouldn't say that right off the bat. I, I couldn't put a timeline on it. 
and the discretion is based on the hazard of the danger of the building. Which you can't know without having examined the building, or at least... Yes, or know something about it through the assessor's office or through building permits or history of the building that we've had, had we been in it or had a previous fire or renovations or something like that. That's, that's where all the data is primarily garnered. And then for anything new, it would be able to be taken right off the plans that were in rev it being reviewed before the building was built. So there'd be a way to move forward with newer buildings and construction that that information would be up front. And then anything else would have to be obtained in a retroactive sort of way. Again, ultimately, it's not to put something on somebody's house that they don't want or to, to create any type of police state. It's, it's only to give us some additional measures of safety. And that's why it's actually included in the fire code and listed as a firefighter safety measure. The more we know about the buildings we're going in, the better we're able to strategize how we're going to fight the fire, the better we're able to protect the people inside and the firefighters themselves. That's, that's ultimately the goal. Eli, if I may. Go ahead, Becky. Um, Chief, I don't think anybody argues that we want to keep our firefighters and public safety officers safe. Sure. Um, at all. I think, though, um, from from my perspective, it's it's I don't see a lot of our buildings other than some larger, older homes that might be really in need of the this. Um, and I think that that would likely be met with. Um, some, some pushback, um, mm -hmm. I guess, do you, are there, are there many other small towns like ours that, that routinely employ these, you know, the multi Maltese cross placards, or is this more of sort of industrial areas that have this? I, I really, I really haven't taken a poll here. One, one town that I'm familiar with, it's not here in Massachusetts and New Hampshire, Exeter, New Hampshire, yep. which is an extremely old town, has a really great downtown. They have this, they have both of these in place and you can drive around in these various buildings you see all, all over town that, that have these. It could be an office building. It, it might be a large apartment building. It could be a storage unit. Um, it, it's varied. I, I haven't taken a poll of the local communities as to whether or not um, they enforce this um, or have adopted it. Mm -hmm. Again, a, a lot of times by adopting it, you're bringing on more work because right. it's not something right. that's going to do it itself. So anybody that doesn't feel like it's either worthwhile or the time is a, it, it, it's a good uh, benefit for the time spent may avoid it. And that's why it's offered as an option that it has to be, it's not adopted by the state, but has to be adopted individually. Um, so the state- Yeah, can you know, I think that, you know, we of course want, you know, everybody safe, those who sure. are, you know, putting their lives on the line for us. Yeah. I, I guess just one of the things for me is, you know, we're a small town and, yeah. and um, you know, if, it, it's it's hard for me to wrap my mind around um, that type of a process mm -hmm. for a town as small and intimate as we are. Um, and again, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. That's just kind of oh, you know, my... yeah, yeah. Thank and you, Chief. Thank you, Eli. Yeah. Well, and if and if it's and if it's easier, and you want to separate these two because you're not fond of the placard and wanted more time to think about it or whatever. Um, again, the, the one about the vacant building placard is already in the code and already enforceable. Um, so, so that could happen regardless. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Just looking for that extra designations there at the end of the, uh, the paperwork under the signs to add to the signs because that's not specifically laid out in the code. 
but would be helpful to us. So if that makes it more palatable or easier or need more information to come back to this particular piece at a time, another time that I, I totally understand that as well. Just as a comment, uh, the concern I have is the cost of this, um, mm -hmm. because it's not just a question of how much time does it take to convert the buildings in Manchester to this placard, but that every placard has to be under the regulations for this that I see has to be inspected yearly for compliance to see whether it's you know been taken off or whether it's yep. been taken over or whatever. So um, that's that's probably as you said going to take a dedicated a dedicated fire safety officer um, who we don't we don't have and. Um, we're, we're trying to get right. more fire safety officers, fire, fire, fire personnel on each shift yeah. um, to cover um, the circumstances. I, you know, this is the dilemma. This is a real dilemma because what you present makes a lot of sense in terms of the safety of our fire personnel. And, um, and I echo the other comments. Oh, I appreciate it. We want you all to be safe, sure. but the um, the logistics of this and the cost of it, um, I, I really would like to understand other small towns that have uh, in Massachusetts that have done this and and uh, how they've managed it. I, I will be happy to look into that, and that's why my intent wasn't that every building in town will have one of these, based on the initial um, investment in time, as well as the continued investment in time. If, and it would be for the most hazardous buildings first. And that's gonna be defined in a bylaw hall. Well, they, if, if you look in here, they list the different types of ratings based okay. on the hazard content and construction types. So it would be evaluated based on those which are already laid out in the code. Okay. Low, medium, and high hazard. So we'd start with the high hazard buildings and the ones that had the most suspect types of construction that are most likely to collapse or burn in a fire or something like that. But I get you, in a, in a, in a perfect world, we'd be able to put it on everything. We'd have somebody that that's their job to put them on and to go around and inspect them, but that, that's not likely to happen. So that's why the goal wasn't that everybody gets one. And in a perfect world, we wouldn't be sued because it wasn't on the building. <laughs> True. <laughs> yep. Because I think if you do this, you're going to have to be all in. Or you're going to have to specify in the bylaw what level mm -hmm. of hazard. Understood. I can I can certainly go back and look at that and and like you say talk to some of the other towns and see who uses it how they apply it what the, what the relative time cost is what the relative dollar cost is and and um, get you guys that information I'm happy to do that thank you oh you're welcome great idea good when you mentioned Exeter you, you mentioned industrial commercial properties uh, in fact do one family homes also have these things up there? I hadn't seen them on there yet. Um, I, I, again, I, I worked at Phillips Exeter and they, they didn't adopt yeah. that because they were a private school. But I know in town there were some buildings that did belong to Phillips Exeter that had these on them. One was a single story office building and it was because it had a truss roof, which truss roofs under fire collapse. So it was a single okay. story accounting office, but it is an extreme hazard to firefighters if it's under fire. And if you didn't know the construction of the roof, you could get too far in the building and it would be a problem. Okay. Again, it's not a single family home, but. Nope. Um, it's nope. not. No. Nope. Okay. Yeah, be curious. Let's mm -hmm. do a little homework. Certainly. All right. So to move things along here, it sounds to me like we don't have consensus on the board for actually putting the placard request onto the spring annual town meeting um, warrant. 
there might be support for putting the sprinklers on the <clears throat> warrant. So I'd like to go back now to uh, asking the board which of these two things <clears throat> would we support putting onto the warrant for the spring, the annual town meeting. And let's just go around the board and just ask straight up, Mr. Turner, Ms. Bodner, Mr. Turner. Um, I would support the, the uh, H and I, and at this time, based on the information um, and discussion that we've had, I would not support the other. Mr. Brown, uh, I have the same opinion. Yes, the sprinkler, no, the no, the signage. Ms. Harrison, I'm not comfortable with either. Ms. Jakes. Um, I am of the same mind as Jeff and John. I would support the sprinklers um, subject to, um, uh, with the caution that we definitely need to communicate ahead of time um, to the residents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I really don't want to see us um, appear to be taking a position on, on Powder House Lane. My question about Powder House Lane, Ann, was um, answered that there would have to be substantial reconstruction. And I think that's already an existing sprinkler system in that building. I am perfectly willing to support it at the H and I, if Powder House Lane does have an existing sprinkler system. Okay. I, I will say that um, based on whatever the renovations are, the designs um, and the classification of the building could trigger a sprinkler system if it doesn't have it outside of H and I, because there are already sprinkler requirements for other types of buildings, such as the 40B that was coming in. Right. So not adopting H and I wouldn't necessarily exclude Powder House based on the, the type of design. I'm not familiar with it. I can't tell you it has a sprinkler system yet, but I, I don't want to make anybody think it's one thing when it's not. And I think it's important for multi person dwellings to have that added protection. Again, the goal is to give you two minutes to exit the building is what right. the entire goal mm -hmm. of sprinkler is. Not to lessen property damage, not to take the place of the fire department, mm -hmm. but when your yeah. sprinkler goes off because there's a fire in conjunction with your fire alarm system, you have protected time to get out of the building. And that's why the sprinkler is a life safety device. Nothing more than that. Thank you. All right. Um, Greg, did you have any comments that you wanted to make in here? Uh, no, I think, I think you're good here. You can uh, take a look at how the things are shaping up for, uh, for the warrant. I, I think we do need to be, we need to be mindful of <laughs> the length of the warrant, given that we're going to be outside. All right, what I'd like to do, I think, is uh, tentative, tentatively move forward with um, sprinklers on the warrant, but we're gonna finalize the warrant um, at our next meeting. Yes. Why don't we make our final decision on this at our next meeting and have Alan there at the same time. Board members okay with that? Yes. Yes, if uh, particularly if Chief Cleary could uh, put together what I want to say is a term sheet, but that's not what I mean. Um, but, mean? A, but a bulleted list of the points in H and I um, that uh, could be used for communication purposes. I imagine uh, similar prior to, to the town meeting, similar to a frequently asked questions. Yep. How will this affect this if I own this building, and how, what is it, and what it is not, and 
uh, I'm thinking more in terms of a summary sheet. Um, okay, fair enough. And you know, you could, you maybe could put in a few FAQs, but sure. You put in FAQs, then somebody's going to say, "But wait a minute, my building is this at town meeting, and that's what we're trying to avoid." Sure. Mm -hmm. All right, we good on this for now? Thank you very much for your time. I know it went long. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief Cleary. All right. Item number four on the agenda, the annual town meeting, FY22 budget discussion. Greg? So in terms of, um, uh, in terms of the warrant, um, you know, so far we have basically the, the, the standard budgetary items, uh, approval of annual reports. Um, a number of those items can be done by a consent agenda. We used that successfully uh, last year. I think Alan was um, uh, thinking that he would do it again this coming year. Mm -hmm. um, so the, you know, the basic budget items from town operating to town capital to um, capital exclusions, to the water and sewer budgets, the school budget. Um, and then we do have at this point five petition articles. So there's um, uh, one saying that any zoning article should not be voted on at, at this coming annual town meeting. Um, there, there aren't any proposed at this point. So um, that shouldn't take long to deal with. Um, there are. <coughs> um, um, articles related to um, the 40B project uh, from SLV, uh, vote to uh, straw vote to say the town is not in favor of it. Um, there's also a, an article to change our bylaws to say that any um, large project would require um, two access points, not just a single access road. And there's a, a, a fourth petition article um, wanting expanded blasting guidelines for large projects. And then the fifth petition article is a, an article, again, uh, be a non-binding vote, but it would um, seek the opinion of the assembled as to whether or not uh, dispatch should remain in-house and that we not pursue um, uh, dispatch services from the, uh, the regional 911 center. Um, so those are five articles that um, are required to be on the warrant because of um, they are citizen petition articles and they have the requisite number of signatures on it. Um, so you just talked now, you just finished your conversation about potentially adding the, um, the sprinkler bylaw, if we can give it that name. And, and so those will determine the, the total number of, of articles that we have. So there are about 10 standard, um, sort of what I would call your standard articles related to budget and various uh, annual uh, approvals you know, from the annual reports to, to um, not giving salaries to elected officials and that sort of thing. Um, and then these five, and then maybe the sixth one would be the sprinkler article. Uh, in, in terms of the budget, uh, the finance committee is, is um, really finishing things up. They're winding down. They only have uh, one outstanding capital item to, uh, to debate still, um, possible uh, funding for planning board study uh, related to the uh, limited commercial district. Um, everything else they, they have approved. Um, they are aiming for a, a tax increase of no higher than one and a half percent. Um, which is um, below our typical two and a half. Um, not as good as this current year, which came in at a zero, uh, but, but still um, a very good effort. Um, that's possible um, primarily through a um, little less conservative estimation of our local receipts, those being you know, our excise taxes on cars and uh, fees from permits, um, of that, of that nature, 
funds from the um, from the park and rec and the revolving dollars uh, that the beach brings in. Um, so that makes it possible, plus um, um, some lower increases on health insurance and, and other uh, staff costs. Um, so I would say a, a lot of discussion from the um, finance committee about the uh, size of the town's fund balance, as uh, often called free cash. Um, we are at the higher end of our range. Um, the target is really closer to the 10% and we're um, probably in that 14% uh, area. And so there's a concern that, you know, the town is sitting on too much of taxpayers' money. Um, in, in using those dollars, they should be used for one-time expenses. Otherwise you dig yourself a hole in future years. And I think we need to be conscious of that and avoid that problem. Um, but certainly we can uh, look at ways to um, draw down those reserves by putting a little more into some of the one-time capital costs. And, and there certainly are plenty of those that we have. And so I think there can be ways to um, correct that amount of, of funding that is, is sitting um, at, the, at the moment in, a, in an idle fashion. Um, one of the topics that have been kicked around is whether or not we should have more targeted, uh, additional uh, targeted uh, stabilization accounts. Uh, many towns use them for uh, a host of different projects that uh, they are planning you know, down the road and they're putting aside money for those projects. So there's, you know, that goes back to whether or not we should be collecting money we're not spending right away. Um, we, we currently do that just for our fire apparatus, um, ambulance and fire trucks. Um, you know, we could be doing it for some other projects as well, but so far we have not chosen to do that. And so it just brings up that whole debate as to whether or not we should be um, putting aside dollars or waiting until we need the money and asking the voters to, to dig into their pockets at, at that point in time. Um, you know, pros and cons of, of both approaches. So it's something I think it'd be worthwhile for you to, uh, to talk about with, with the finance committee um, as, as we look ahead to future budgets. Um, so that's where we are uh, with the budget. Uh, as Eli indicated, uh, we need to wrap things up at your next meeting on the third uh, as we get things to the printer. So we'll be looking for your final approval of uh, the proposed budget at your next meeting. And we'll um, provide you an, uh, an updated version of the budget with all those numbers as the FinCom has uh, recommended. And so we'll run through those at your meeting on the third to see if you have any final uh, questions or changes before asking you to um, vote to advance that budget to, uh, to town meeting. And we'll do the same with the, uh, with the warrant. Uh, we'll get that a draft to you uh, prior to, to that next meeting so you have time to, to review it. And, um, and again, any changes that we make on the third and then we, uh, we're off to the printers in preparation for uh, town meeting on, uh, on June 21st. In the meantime, we do have the elections coming up um, as it was mentioned at the very start of the meeting um, on May, May 18th. So at this point, um, you know, any uh, input or discussion that you would like to have uh, regarding the warrant itself um, or any questions or concerns about the budget as it's getting finalized? Yeah. I have a question, uh, Greg. You said that the petition articles, once they are signed by the requisite number of residents are mandatory and have to go on to the warrant. Um, I have a concern about a petition article um, or any warrant article that restricts other warrant articles from being raised or voted on that have been uh, properly approved by uh, FinCom and the selectmen. In particular, I'm concerned about the restriction on any warrant articles about bylaws being heard in this meeting. Um, that seems to me to be um, antithetical, 
antithetical to um, the purpose of town meeting, which is to review the business of the town and to say, nope, you can't review this business. And I'm putting in an article that says you can't review it. Um, that, that seems to me to be uh, a problem. Now, maybe I'm just ignorant. Um, I call myself naive early, I have to switch around, but um, I just don't understand how that can be. So, um, you know, I, I raised some of the same questions uh, when I saw that particular petition article come up. And uh, town council um, believes that the petition article can stand and have effect. Um, it's weird. I will completely agree with your position that it seems antithetical to um, good governance um, and a reasonable way to approach things. So if there were a petition article that said there can be no increase in the police department's budget or the public safety budget, um, and that was a petition article, that would have to be heard before our budget. And yes. if it passed, and if it passed, it wouldn't give us an opportunity to review the budget in town meeting and, and discuss it. So, so in essence, it's, it's taking those, those budget items and saying, you know, zero increase. Um, but it's, it's up to the voters ultimately to say yes or no to that particular line of thinking. So this article will have to go before any bylaw that we are saying that we're gonna put into the agenda for this, the uh, warrant for this meeting, this bylaws so uh, it, it just talks about zoning amendments it doesn't talk about any bylaw it just it specifically says no zoning amendments and at this point there are no zoning amendment articles proposed so it's it's really um it's really a moot point okay it may be a moot point but i i stand with eli and i don't understand the, the logic of town council well, town council is, uh, you know, they stand on the letter of law and they're very extraordinarily pedantic and uh, they don't, they don't judge. They just say whether or not it, it's legal. So can this be brought up meeting after meeting after meeting where, you know, no zoning bylaw mm -hmm. changes, there's no zoning amendments? Sure. You can file an article at any time. Now, the, the barrier for filing a petition out article at a special town meeting is significantly higher than at an annual town meeting. Mm -hmm. So annual town meeting requires 10 signatures. And I believe at a special town meeting, in order to put a petition article on the warrant, you need to have 100 signatures. I think that's right. Any other comments from board members? Not on this specific, but if if it's allowed to move on to the item that's in front of that the the um, finance committee hasn't the capital item that the finance committee hasn't taken up yet. Yeah. Um, can Greg, can you explain what that's about? I thought we'd studied the LCD until we had named every damn tree. <laughs> so, Rocket tree, yeah. Uh, so the, the planning board did debate um, a, a, a marketing research study to see what the market might bear or, or might be interested in for new development in, in, the, in the LCD broadly off of both exits. Um, the finance committee has um, had some reluctance to approve that. I think <laughs> uh, consistent perhaps with your comment, Ann. 
And so um, at this point, it's not in there. And they were giving the planning board one last chance to, to argue for it. Thank you. Other board members or comments? So I'd like to express an opinion around the uh, tax rate. Um, I, I think I do support at this point the uh, um, proposed tax rate that uh, FinCom uh, is suggesting for this year. I do have um, <coughs> concerns about future years and uh, some of the long-term planning for um, dealing with uh, variations in um, uh, budgets that are sometimes beyond our control. So periodically things happen in the school district that um, require um, you know, temporary uh, more funding. Um, and um, I think some if we're going to really, really tighten down the budget, uh, I think paying attention to some of those potential um, operating expenses that can experience bubbles will be important. And I think also uh, looking at some of the uh, potential upcoming capital projects and um, considering more carefully uh, the degree to which we want to leave some reserves available for funding some of them so that we could do them with uh, uh, capital exclusions as opposed to actually firing up debt uh, will be important because right now our, our 20 and 30 year capital plans are pretty well booked. And um, to do significant new capital efforts will require us to raise money. And if we have sufficient uh, planning and reserves, then maybe we can blunt that. So uh, I have concerns about tightening it up too much. That's uh, just out of conservatism. Any other board members with any comments on the budget side of things before we move on? Greg, did you need anything more from the board tonight on this? No, I'm good. Thank you. Consent agenda, Board of Selectmen meetings from April 5th, acceptance of the Surf, Surf Village conservation restriction, which has already been approved by um, <clears throat> CONCOM and uh, Planning Board. Yep and a reserve fund transfer for IT costs because we're going to move, well, mostly related to moving to off Microsoft Office 365, which is expensive. Uh, any questions or comments from the board members on any of these items? Eli, the Jeff, go ahead. The move to Microsoft 365 is a recurring expense, isn't it? Yes, it is. So we, we had it built into next year's budget. But we're going to use reserves to move it into this year? We're using the reserves to pay for it for this year's expense, which we didn't budget for originally. Um, but now we are budgeting it for it going forward. Thank you for clarifying that, Greg. Yep. Motion to approve consent agenda. If there's no other discussion. Can I get a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, Mr. Bob Turner? Yes. Mr. Round? Yes. Harris? Yes. Jakes? Yes. Mr. Bowling, yes. Town administrator's report, item number six. Okay, thank you. Um, moving forward on the uh, path from the town hall parking lot over to Beach Street, um, lining up um, the surveyor to 
make sure we know where property lines are and, and working with, um, well, with John Ron's help and uh, Jim Brown's help as well. And then Nate and Chuck are we taking a look at that layout. We hope to have um, a specific uh, plan for you to review and approve um, in, in pretty short order here. We'd love to get it um, built and functioning um, before the summer season kicks into high gear. Um, town hall uh, reopening for regular business. We'll be looking at uh, sometime in May here to, um, to allow people to come in. Uh, we may do it at a, on a gradual basis. Uh, for example, you know, maybe people with last names A through L or morning and M through Z or in the afternoon or something like that, just to try to keep uh, numbers um, uh, tamped down just a bit. Obviously still want to practice good uh, protocols in terms of mask wearing and keeping distance and, and all that good stuff. Um, but I think as, uh, as more and more people get vaccinated, we, we become increasingly comfortable with uh, having town hall open um, beyond just four appointments, which is the current situation. Um, uh, construction wise, uh, a lot of things are going out to bid for new construction season, uh, the painting of Seaside One, um, revised compost project is uh, about to be out on the street. Uh, some additional water line work that's being planned, um, the Tux Point floats going out to bid as, uh, as well as summer paving. Um, so that's, that's all underway. Um, and um, uh, yeah, that, that's, that'll do me for now. Questions from board members? Eli, if I may, uh, not, not mentioned, but there's the ongoing appraisal of the Masons building. Has anything happened on that? Uh, been, been delayed, but we do have someone lined up to do that um, uh, and complete it by the end of June. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. So uh, I have no other manners as may not have been reasonably anticipated by the chair. Any other board members have any other comments that we need to make? All right, well, we'll be going to into executive session tonight. So um, I will make a motion that the board move into executive session not to return to open session under Massachusetts general law. Chapter 30A, section 21A, uh, reason number two, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel. I got a second. Second. Uh, this is a roll call vote, as are all of the meetings ever since we became virtual. Um, Mr. Bob Turner. Yes. Mr. Brown. Yes. Ms. Harrison. Yes. Ms. Jakes. Yes. Mr. Bowling votes yes. All right. Um, so I'll give uh, people a couple of minutes to vacate and then I'll check the remaining people out and we will move on with our meeting. All right, and I think Mr. Sherman is uh, not part of this, right? Correct. Mr. Sherman, uh, I'm going to uh, remove you from the meeting now so that we can proceed under executive session. The list of people we have here, this looks good. Lock the meeting. Hold on. <laughs> 